Revelation chapter 11 I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshippers, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for forty-two months, and I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for one thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying, and they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts, because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, while their enemies looked on. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign for ever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. Hello and welcome to the next video, the latest video in the Revelation series. Now, uh, you might want to just stop the video right now, uh, pray and read that passage again in your own Bible and see if you recognise any of the images that are in there from other parts of the Bible. OK, so we have been looking at the seven trumpets the seven warnings to the world that judgment is coming uh, last time if you remember we we talked about judgment god's judgment being bittersweet you know we want to see a world that's uh, that's a, a place where justice is done we want to see poverty ended don't we we want to see greed and war done away with we don't want to see children who are abandoned we don't want to see starvation anymore so we, we want justice we want God to come back uh, and, and fix all the problems we want that but we also recognize that judgment is terrible uh, terrible news for many people that we love 
and would be for us too, uh, were it not for the, the good news, the grace of God in the gospel in our lives. Well, today I, I, I want to share with you uh, one more set of pictures. And then at the very end today, we'll find ourselves back in the throne room uh, with the seventh trumpet. So today uh, is called uh, the mission of God's church. That's what I've called it. Uh, and four different headings, the security of God's church, the spread of God's church, the silencing of God's church and the success of of God's church. Now today is not it's not going to be as short as some of the uh, recent ones. It's going to be a little bit longer. There's more to to get through, but I hope you find it a blessing, uh, as I have. So first of all, the security of God's church. I want to look at verse one and two of chapter eleven, um, where John, the apostle John, uh, the writer of Revelation, is told to to go and measure the temple. So he has this vision. He's told to go and measure the temple. Well, who else was told to go and measure? The temple. Does that ring any bells for you? Um, <clears throat> Ezekiel was. Um, Ezekiel chapters forty through to about forty-eight, I think, is 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 uh, is all about the temple. And Ezekiel has a vision uh, of a temple, and it's it's a huge, vast, impregnable building, far far better and more impressive than any of the the actual real life temples that had uh, uh, that have existed. Um, uh, and the image we see in Ezekiel is of this totally safe, totally secure place. And there's loads of symbolism in there. In fact, I've preached a sermon on this, which uh, I'll link to in the, in the description of the video if you're interested in reading more about Ezekiel's temple. Uh, but for John, John was told to go measure it too. And I, I guess if you had heard this, if you were one of the first readers of the book of Revelation, your mind would have gone straight to Ezekiel. And, and you, therefore you get this idea that the church is secure. Whatever happens, God's people are safe forevermore. But, but he uses this interesting phrase, outside the temple, the holy city is trampled on by the Gentiles, the unbelievers in the, the outer courts where the Gentiles can go. Um, <clears throat> it talks about whole, the holy city and the, whole, the, the outer courts of the temple being trampled on by Gentiles, by unbelievers. Oh, and we see that all around us, don't we? We see holy things trampled on by an unbelieving world. You know, if <clears throat> if you go on YouTube, you see the mockery of YouTubers. Uh, you see the TV comedians, the derision of newspaper columnists and bloggers. And, and many of them just uh, uh, making fun of our faith. And, and, um, and you know, <clears throat> I, I don't mind people making fun in, in a nice way. You know, we can laugh at ourselves too. And to be honest, the Vicar of Dibley does not offend me. Um, but, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in a cruel way. And maybe you've experienced that at home or at work, where you you just cruelly mocked. But the security, uh, the, the, the true church, however, is secure. There's trampling going on outside, but forever secure inside. And that's that's always been the way and always will be the way. So that's verse one and two, security. Second, this is the meter where we want to go today. Um, <clears throat> uh, the spread of the church. Verses three to six. So it talks about these two witnesses. Verse three, I will appoint my two witnesses and they will prophesy. I will appoint my two witnesses and they will prophesy. Well, what do witnesses do? Witnesses speak out, don't they? They speak out. And prophecy is to speak out God's truths in its simplest form. Um, so that's, that's what it's saying. I'm... Uh, so there's this picture here of two witnesses who will speak out God's truth and they're clothed in sackcloth, it says, because this is a message of repentance that they have. Uh, it, you know, putting, putting your faith and your hope in, in Jesus for salvation. It's a serious message. So they wear sackcloth to show that it's serious. And it says they are they are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. Okay, so so straight away you've got to see these are not literal people. 
Okay, so, so these are not two literal witnesses because they're also olive trees and they're also lampstands. Okay, so, so it can't be talked about literal. This is symbolic language. This is how the book of Revelation works. So olive trees and lampstands, does that ring any bells for you? I wonder if you know your Bible well, um, Zechariah chapter 4. Uh, if you want to have a pause of the video and go read it now, that might be helpful to you too. <clears throat> okay, so in that vision, uh, in Zechariah chapter 4, uh, there's a lampstand and it's fed with oil from two olive trees. Uh, and, and the idea is, that's where olive oil comes from, of course. So the, the idea is the light of the lampstand will never go out and the oil is the spirit of God. And there's this very f famous phrase, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. That's how the, the kingdom of God is going to be achieved. Um, not by might or power, but by God's spirit. And the spirit is the oil in the olive trees that feeds the lampstand. So, um, take your back, yourself back to Revelation 11. If you're one of the original readers of Revelation, you're immediately thinking, ah, well, he's talking about the light of God's good news going on forever. And that's good, isn't it? While, while being trampled on by an unbelieving world, still the light of God's word shines out. The message will always go out. Evil spiritual forces cannot silence the gospel. And then in, in verse 6, um, talking about these two witnesses, um, it says this, they have the power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain. Does that remind you of anyone? They have the power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain. Well, that's Elijah, isn't it? 1 Kings 17, um, you might remember Elijah's story. That, uh, he's living um, uh, under the rulership of Ahab, one of the worst kings of the Old Testament, maybe the worst king of the Old Testament. Uh, he's tried to kill, tried to destroy uh, Elijah uh, many times and it certainly seemed to Elijah that he's the only one left on God's side. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, James 5.17 talks about it as well. Um, Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Uh, so yeah I, Elijah in the midst of this terrible persecution by this awful king prays that it's not going to rain it doesn't rain for three and a half years and during that time God provides miraculously for Elijah keeps him safe keeps him alive keeps him well three and a half years later there's a great big showdown with the prophets of Baal you remember that where Elijah calls down fire from heaven and wins a great victory and all the prophets of Baal end up dead it's a great story <clears throat> Uh, but you, do you see the relevance of that? So it's saying, you know, in a time of intense persecution, God protects Elijah. Um, and then three and a half years later comes a great victory. Let's talk. Let's move on a little bit. They also have the power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague. Well, who's that remind you of? That's not Elijah anymore. That's Moses, isn't it? You remember the time of, again, a time of intense persecution of God's people in Egypt this time. Um, and uh, they're slaves in Egypt, aren't they? And, uh, and through God's miraculous intervention, uh, there's that set of ten plagues. The first one, the Nile, the river Nile turns to blood. That's what it's talking about. They have the power to turn the waters into blood. Um, uh, and and through that, they, through these uh, miraculous intervention, they survive and they thrive. So what do Elijah and Moses have in common? Well, Elijah represents the prophets. He's the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. Moses represents the law. And that's why Elijah and Moses appear with Jesus at the Transfiguration. The law and the prophets for, of the Old Testament both point to Jesus. So <clears throat> we've got a fairly complicated and detailed picture emerging here. Now forgive me, I know this is there's a lot here. Um, 
But the two witnesses, the two witnesses are the church. They must be. They are the church speaking the word of God, empowered by the spirit, pointing to Jesus, just like the prophets and the, uh, the Lord and the prophets of the Old Testament did. And when persecution comes and it seems like it's all over, God intervenes and saves. And that's the message of, of this part of chapter 11. It's a wonderful message. Uh, very clever, picking out bits of the Old Testament uh, and using them symbolically uh, to, to encourage God's church, which is suffering. What about these dates? <clears throat> Let's talk about dates for a minute. So verse 3, it talks about the witnesses testifying for 1,260 days. Uh, verse 2 tells us about the trampling of, the, uh, of holy things for 42 months. Well, 1,260 days is the same as 42 months. If, if you take a month as being 30 days, which is what they did um, in, the, in at those times, um, 1,260 days equals 42 months, and that's the same as three and a half years. Okay, so, um, which is Elijah's persecution followed by victory. So the, the picture altogether that these dates are giving us, three and a half years represents the church age. That's the time between Jesus leaving, Jesus' ascension, going to heaven, the time between that and his second coming. Okay, that's the three and a half years. It's the, what we call the church age. Seven, seven, of course, would be the fullness of time. Okay, we're not talking about seven years. We're talking about half of that, which is the church age. We've already had a lot of time, haven't we? So we're in the second half of time now. Um, uh, the church age, three and a half years. Uh, and the message is for all the time the world mocks and tramples spiritual things. The word of God will continue to be proclaimed. But it won't be a walk in the park. It'll be hard. There'll be persecution. But God's word will survive and the gospel will continue to go out. Let's move on a little bit. <clears throat> Third heading, silence, the silencing of the church, verse 7 to 10. So this is a similar theme, but it... It gets a little bit darker, quite a lot darker, actually. So it says, when, it describes how, um, if you read that passage, it describes how when these two witnesses have finished their testimony, at, at the appointed time, at God's appointed time, the beast from the abyss, that Satan, will attack and overpower and destroy them. Now, bear in mind, we said, we said the witnesses are the church, okay? So at God's appointed time, Satan will be released from the abyss, will attack, overpower, destroy them. And it describes their bodies lying in the public square, in the city centre. And all the people of the earth come and gloat and celebrate. Uh, because the witnesses have tormented the world with all this talk about God's judgment. And now they're dead and everyone celebrates. <coughs> but note, it's only for... Uh, verse 9, it's only for three and a half days, three and a half days. So that's a very short time, isn't it, compared to three and a half years. So three and a half years is the church age between Jesus' ascension and Jesus' second coming. So for a very short time, three and a half days, Satan will be released and will attack and overpower and destroy them. What is going on here? I think there's two ways to understand this, and I think it's probably one of those things that's both and rather than either or. Um, I, th I think it is talking about Satan being released for a while. Um, we saw that in the fifth trumpet warning uh, in chapter 9. We also see it in Revelation 20, uh, verse 3 and verse 8. Um, this idea that Satan is bound now, and that's why this, the gospel has spread like wildfire throughout our world. But towards the end of the church age... The world will get a taste of hell to drive people towards the Saviour, like a last-ditch warning. And it could be that, three and a half days, a very short time of satanic power reigning on the earth where the church is severely oppressed. Or it could be reminding us uh, that this is the experience of the church throughout the church age. 
<clears throat> there have been many times in history, haven't there, when it's looked like, it's felt like God's church is dead. Where it's, it's felt like faith has been lying dead in the market square. Uh, and it feels like the world has gathered around mocking the dead body of God's church. I don't think we're meant to be discouraged by this. Jesus described this kind of thing too. Mark 13, 23. Jesus, after describing similar things, says, Be on your guard. I've told you everything in advance. You know, we're meant to be prepared for these things so that it doesn't freak us out. There's a little encouragement here. Uh, Revelation 11, verse 8. A little mention of Jesus. I don't know if you spotted that. That's exactly what happened with Jesus, isn't it? He's lying dead in a tomb. His enemies think that they've silenced him. Satan thinks he's won. But <laughs> three days later, up from the grave, he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. You know, so let's let's move on in our thinking, shall we, to the victory, to the salvation. This letter is meant to encourage us. So even when the church feels like it's... Um, uh, dead in the market square that is not the end of the story so let's let's move to the end of the story our fourth heading salvation so verse 11 to 19 uh, after the three and a half days so it's a very short period where the church looks like it's defeated the breath of god or the spirit of god same word in in the greek breath of breath of uh, life from god entered them and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. Okay, so remember this is the church we're talking about. These two witnesses of the church. In other words, when, when it looks like the church is dead and buried for a short time, don't be afraid. Life will come back. The breath of God, the spirit of God will come and refresh and renew and ultimately God will take his people home. You know, the demise of the church has been predicted many, many times. Uh, the French philosopher Voltaire said this, uh, 100 years from my day, there will not be a Bible on earth except one that is looked upon by an antiquarian curiosity seeker. In other words, the only people who will be interested in reading a Bible will be researchers and they have to go to a, a library to go and read one. Uh, that, and that view was incredibly influential, incredibly influential in his day. The, the truth is that 100 years later, I, I, great irony, uh, 100 years later, his old house was being used as a storage facility for the Evangelical Society of Geneva. And his old house was piled high with Bibles and Christian literature, <laughs> which always makes me, me laugh. Um, but there are other examples too. North, North Korea. North Korea is currently the number one um, uh, uh, country on the world watch list. Um, uh, um, uh, in, in other words, it's the worst place to be a Christian in the whole world. Um, did you know that until 1948, North Korea was hugely Christianized? Um, Pyongyang was known as the Jerusalem of the East. Uh, did you also know that uh, Kim Jong Un's great grandparents were devout Christians? His his great grandfather was a missionary. His great grandmother was a deacon in the Presbyterian Church. And now, today, it feels like they're mocking the dead body of the church in North Korea, doesn't it? But it's only for a while. It's only for a while. Life will return. In verse 13, we see, I read it a moment ago, um, judgment arrives as the church is taken away into heaven. So the, the church goes off, um, goes up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies look on. There's this massive earthquake. Um, 7,000 people die, it says. Seven, seven again being the number of completion. Thousand just meaning huge number. So a uh, huge number, uh, the full number of people die and go to judgment. And we find ourselves back in the throne room 
back in the throne room. You see that right at the end of, of chapter 11. Uh, you, we've, we've gone around the cycle again. Let me just mention just a couple of things about, about this, this scene in heaven here. And then, we'll done. Uh, th then we're done. So, first of all, uh, Jesus reigns forever. I think this is great. Um, look at the, the, the song the angels are singing, verse 15. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah. And he will reign forever and ever. Well, that's Jesus, isn't it? He will reign forever and ever. That's Jesus. And it's good to remind ourselves, isn't it, that when the church is beaten up, when the church is mocked and defeated, one day King Jesus will begin to reign forever and ever. Other kings come and go. Oppressive dictators come and go. And they look so powerful for a while. But in the end, it's only for a short time. Skeptical and cynical academics who look so influential. But it's only for a short time. But our Jesus reigns forever and ever. That's the point of that verse, I'm sure. We're meant to compare the length of his reign to the reign of those who reign on the earth for three and a half days. Lastly, uh, verse 18, the nations were angry and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small. I wonder if that rings any bells for anyone. I, I, th I think this is a reference to Psalm 2. And again, if you want to pause it here uh, and, and read that, then feel free. <coughs> so we see the, the nations gathering around to rise up against the Lord and against his Messiah. That's what's happening in Psalm 2. The nations gathering around to rise up in rebellion against God and against the Messiah. The kings of the earth, powerful, influential, rise up against God. But how does God react in Psalm 2? Uh, it says he laughs. He laughs at their puny efforts. And he says, I have installed my king, Jesus. I've installed my king. He's not going anywhere. He will reign forever and ever. Don't be afraid of ungodly leaders, ungodly governments. Their reign is temporary. And our king, Jesus, our eternal king, will reward his people, both great and small. I love that. He will reward his people, both uh, uh, your people who revere your name, both great and small. <clears throat> uh, and today, however insignificant you might feel in the kingdom of God, it might be that as you're listening to this, it just all feels like this is um, uh, something so big and so outside my. Well, what has this got to do with my day-to-day -day existence? You know, what has this got to do with with with, with what I? Um, with my Facebook feed or my cynical spouse who I, have, who I live with, uh, but they make my life quite difficult sometimes about this. What is this, going to do? this is what it's got to do with it. Our eternal king will reward his people both great and small. And however insignificant you might feel in the kingdom of God, however small your ministry might be, however behind the scenes it might be, you're not forgotten. You're not forgotten. So let's lift up our heads and stand strong in the time of trouble. Let me pray. Jesus said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would give us peace in this troubled world as we see our culture our nation turning away from you help us not to be afraid please grant us peace because we understand that you have overcome the world amen <clears throat>